The pain pods presented by Tremo Pharmaceuticals and is intended for educational and informational purposes only. Please speak to medical professionals before making any treatment decisions and visit TremoRx.com to learn more about their work. There's no such thing as real or unreal pain. Pain doesn't know gender or culture or anything, right? It afflicts us all. Because it affects so many people in often profound ways. You know, you do a lot of thinking when you're in pain. I think it gives you a certain perspective on life. Definitely did not want to accept it, and I also didn't believe that that was really the plan for my life. I always get through it, though. Always. Hello, this is Patrick, and welcome back to The Pain Podcast Season 1 Roundtable. I'm joined now by public health consultant Christy Van Horn and psychotherapist Dr. Daniel Lyman to discuss some of the takeaways from Season 1, things they learned, maybe things we could have done better, and things we can think about as we move ahead into a hopeful Season 2. So first, I'll just say, welcome, Christy and Daniel, and thanks for being here. Thank you for having me. We're excited to be here. Thank you. Um, I'm curious to know, and maybe Christy, I'll start with you. Do you do you feel like your points of view were accurate, accurately represented in the podcast? Is there anything that you said that we use that you would like to clarify or expand upon, or that we just frankly got wrong? <laughs> no, I I think that you you did a great job of uh, summarizing, you know, some key points about uh, race and and bias. Yeah, I think you did a great job. I wish there were more time. To, to kind of dig a little bit deeper into into the issues. But overall, it was uh, well done. Was there a particular issue that you think could benefit from a, a deeper exploration? Yeah, I mean, I think that, and, you know, this is, I'll just say, you know, something that I was going to mention at the end uh, about things that you could address if you go forward in another series. But I think possibly focusing on and hearing some more voices from women who deal with pain, um, just in general. I think there were a lot of male voices. Um, you had some great experts on who were women, but I think hearing from the perspective of women, pain, women's pain, and um, would have been beneficial. Agreed. Um, yeah. And in in any way, you know, I think that oftentimes women pain is seen as an intrinsic part of our lives where, you know, we deal Hmm. with pain literally monthly for years of our lives. We, um, I don't have children myself, but you know, childbirth. So I think that there are many ways to also sort of hear those voices and, and incorporate those voices into, uh, possibly future podcast interviews. That's a good piece of feedback. What about for you, Daniel? Was there anything that you'd like to expand upon or clarify? Um, just to jump off that, I actually work with a with a, a colleague of mine. She works specifically with various kinds of, I mean, for lack of a better way of saying it right now, women's pain. So that would be definitely somebody I'd love to put you in contact with if you'd like to talk with her. She's kind of the expert in that in terms of psychotherapy. Um, and she's, she's great. I refer everybody to her that is looking for somebody who is uh, focused on female-centric pain experience. So, um, but to answer your question, um, it wasn't, the, there was nothing that I felt like, oh, that was inaccurately represented, or I thought you guys did a really good job. I will say one of the things that, and Dr. Huggins started to talk a little bit about this, which I appreciated her perspective, but uh, I do think I would have loved to hear a little bit more of what she and I both do is very science-based. I think there's this, maybe I'm getting a little defensive because I'm a therapist, but there's a bit of a, of a bias in the, in, in the world towards therapy as being like a little woo-woo or not science-based, not like hard science, you know, they call it a soft science. But everything that we do with pain is based on research. Is And there's plenty of it out there right now. People think that there's not, but there's tons and tons and tons of research about this. And so that's something that, it was not that you guys did wrong at all. It was just something that I think would be great to go a little bit deeper into is to some of the experiments that have been done to demonstrate the efficacy of the work that Dr. Huggins and I are doing. Um, in terms of psychotherapy, using using psychotherapy as a way of treating pain. So. With so much data out there, with so many studies that have yeah. been done, why do you think it is that people, that the perception is different or that pain still feels very misunderstood? There, I think there's a, that's a 
That's a great question. And I feel like I could talk for hours about that, but uh, I think there's a number of reasons for that. I think one, so I see clients all over the world. I have clients in my office here in LA, but I also work online. Um, even before COVID times, I've worked online, people seeing people in, I have clients on five continents right now. And I find that based on the country, people have a different experience of what they, uh, how they understand pain and the culture in which they were raised. Um, I think American culture is very, very opposed to the idea that, uh, I mean, just the simplistic, most simple form, we're very opposed to the idea that your brain can have an effect on the way you feel. It's really scary for people and they become very defensive about that. And I understand it's, it sounds like people are being hypercritical of you or judging you when they say things like that. But I think people get very, very defensive and very cautious around that space. And other cultures, like I have a lot of English patients and they don't seem to care. Mm. <laughs> they don't get defensive about it at all. Weirdly mm. enough, they're all, maybe it's that self-deprecating English humor, but they seem to be very open to the idea of like, okay, <laughs> yeah, I can work on some stuff. I got stuff to figure out, you know? Whereas uh, I find that, and I'm speaking in, you know, generalizations here. These are stereotypes. These are not, it's not, a, it's not true for everybody, but I find sure. that Americans tend to be a bit more, uh, a bit more cautious about the idea that their psychology can affect their pain. So I guess to answer your question, this is my long story long, is that I think there's a cultural expectation and there's a cultural education that we think, okay, pain is purely a physical structural issue and there's no two ways about that. And that's just how we, that's how we treat it here. And it's like everybody who's like dealing with pain that might be related to their anxiety or depression or stuff we all go through, they're kind of like deemed as crazy, which is so terrible and unhealthy and not how the world works. Well, I think that that goes to the stigmatization of mental health yes. in our country overall. Yeah, I mean, I think that's a direct relation to 100%. that. hundred percent, I totally Absolutely. agree. Yeah, there's this, there's this, I mean, literally everyone deals with mental health issues at one point or another in their life, literally everyone. And yet we're so defensive about that. We think it's really terrible if we're to, to share that with people or to be open about that. So yeah, I totally agree. Yeah. There's so much shame around it. There is. Even though and, there shouldn't and be. And I think that yeah. if we dismantle that shame, if we dismantle that stigma, then the idea that pain can be connected to your psychology will not be as big of a deal to people. People might be more open mm. to it. So, I, I, and that, again, that's not to say all pain is related to psychology, but that's my expertise, of course. So I'm going to speak through that lens. Something interesting, what you said, Daniel, about the, um, there's the, the cultural and educational gaps, so to speak, that uh, have something to do with the differences that you see in your patients from around the world. Christy, it's not lost on me as a public health consultant at this particular moment in time. There's conversation from a public health point of view about information we do and do not have, decisions we need to make, can make, maybe shouldn't make until we have more. How, as a public health consultant, how do you think about data and education and culture and, and bridging the gap between there is data and information available, but we still need to make sure it's getting into people's brains and motivating them in the appropriate way. How do you as a public health consultant and educator think about that kind of a thing? I mean, it's, especially in the world we live in today, it's, it's a challenge for us as public health professionals because so many people just for lack of a better term, don't trust science right now. So is, is public health, especially as a public health educator, you know, we really look at data. We look at that research to create uh, trainings and workshops and interventions that hopefully will have an impact on, on behavior and behavior change and really, you know, seeing those results um, through through knowledge and 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 behavior, but it, it's it's a challenge right now. Uh, I'm not going to lie, <laughs> and I think we're all aware of it. But did I answer your question, Patrick, or do you have a follow up? Because yeah, and what did you say? Is the challenge primarily, as you stated, people's not wanting to trust science, not knowing what is uh, valid, where trusted sources actually are. Is that the biggest obstacle, do you think? I think it's, yeah, I think that's one of the obstacles. Yeah. So people don't trust science. People, it's also about access to information, mm -hmm. right? And what to believe and what not to believe. So we can put like right now, I could use the example of wearing face masks. I know that this has nothing to do with pain, but 
there's endless information out there about how to wear them properly, but people aren't paying attention or they don't know what um, or which uh, sources are, are accurate sources. Even though, you know, we feel as public health professionals, we're saying go to the World Health Organization, go to the CDC for this information, but people still tend to believe um, what, you know, is in their Facebook feed versus what the CDC is saying or what the World Health Organization is saying. Um, you know, we're really dealing with, uh, if through COVID, uh, what we refer to as an infodemic. So mm. there's just information coming to people from all these different directions. And it's really hard for anyone to sift through that information to understand what's what's truth and what's not, what's misinformation, what's disinformation. Um, and it's hard when we don't have leadership telling us what's right and what's wrong. Uh, so that adds to the confusion. But I think for pain specifically, you know, we really want to make sure that we're getting accurate information out there. We're supporting people in whatever way that we can um, and helping them to think through what steps they need to take to get the care that they need and they deserve. Switching gears a little bit. And Christy, I think we talked a little bit um, either off mic or in stuff that perhaps was cut about on one hand, going back to women in pain women being called hysterical or it's in your head or being diagnosed with a mental health condition and not being considered for something that might actually physically structurally need attention being able to both hold that truth uh and to acknowledge there are personality traits that can make someone more prone to pain and that that's also true and we talked a little bit about like how how does a provider how do we societally hold space for both of these things and of course so many other nuances when it comes to meaningfully addressing pain one individual at a time that was something for me that was i knew coming in but i think was reinforced with every episode and every conversation how individual the experience of pain is to your point daniel there there's science on all of this including that which some might consider softer or woo woo there's science and data to support it but the experience of people um that that's something that's unique to the individual, right? That's always totally. something, and the individual needs to be taken into account. So yeah, the, that complexity is something that came up for me, and I've, I've actually been thinking about quite a bit since then. I love that point, and actually reminding me that um, uh, there's a doctor based out of Seattle who's a spine surgeon who actually quit doing spine surgeries because he uh, felt that they were no longer working. He thought that that was something that we shouldn't ever do. It wasn't actually su successful in treating pain. Anyway, he's kind of on a mission now to demonstrate how we can treat pain in a very, very different way. And one of the things he just posted about today on, I think on Psychology Today, was all about how we really need to reformat the model of treating people in pain so that the doctor has nothing but time to be with the patient so that it can really be truly about each individual's experience of pain, hear what they're going through, because that in and of itself is so beneficial to feeling better, is so curative that space and time so each individual you know i just want to reflect back or echo back what you're saying because i agree with it so much that each individual's experience of pain even if there are common threads each individual's experience is so unique and if we take it as an individual's experience then they feel hard and that in and of itself feels good <laughs> that just makes people feel better it's kind of oversimplification but feeling hurt makes people feel good yeah thinking about time and space as curative, what a paradigm shift that would be right. from, you know, eight minutes, you're in, you're out. But if it was actually deemed that space and time was part of the therapy, would that not maybe change the way we approached the system itself? It, well, it's, and unfortunately, I mean, I could get deeper into this, but that's going to be a really hard shift to make because it's really hard to capitalize on those things. Now, that's kind of what a therapist does, of course, is like provide space and time. But therapists, like we don't make, you know, we're not, we're not giant companies. We don't, we make fine living, but no one's getting really, really rich off this kind of thing. Whereas so many of the sure. other things that people use for pain is there's a, a money motivation there. There's a motivation to make a fair amount of, to, to exploit the capitalist system and to make a lot of money. So it's tough. Space and time are hard to, to monetize. Unfortunately, that's well said. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, <laughs> Uh, is there anything we've done some of this already, but is there anything that you heard from someone else that you would specifically like to respond to or present a counterpoint to anything like that for you? 
Well, n- there wasn't anything that anybody said that I was like, oh my gosh, how could somebody say that? I will say, and of course, I apologize, I'm blanking on his name now. It was in the third episode, um, which the, the can I actually get better? I forget which doctor. Was that Dr. Ozan? I'm not sure who said something like, well, yeah. that's a tool. He was kind of talking about like, re- responding to like what Dr. Huggins and I were talking about. Basically like, well, that's a tool, but you know, it's, I forget the analogy that he made. Um, you might remember what Dr. Badiola. Yeah, I, I, I recall now the the moment you're speaking of. I'm blanking on the exact analogy, but I recall the moment. Yeah, I did feel a little. So I also, as part of my work, I do like I've trained plenty of doctors and gone to hospitals and done trainings like that. And there is a little bit of MDs are not trained in a psychology. That's just not part of the training. And so there's a little bit of defensiveness that I get from MDs. And I felt that just a little bit then. And I don't want to like stomp on him because I actually really respected what he said, but I could feel that defensiveness there. And I was like, I know, I know I'm talking like a therapist now. I can't help it. <laughs> but I, uh, but that was the moment where I was like, oh, okay. Like I think maybe more information, more education would actually be helpful here. So not just for him, but for those listening as well. I'm hopeful that because in part, um, in part, we had done a pretty deep dive on TMS and mind-body approach in episode two, and kind of going yeah. back to what we were talking about earlier with the freedom we had, we liked making that choice, but it also meant, all right, we're making a very, are we saw, are we answering questions too early in the season? Are we suggesting yeah. that there are, um, yeah, are we, that's essentially it, are we answering questions too early in the season? So we thought mm-hmm. it was very helpful for Dr. Badiola to totally. to have that take and, and shift the focus because it allowed us to just remind people we're not saying like this is the finish line. Totally. And I agree. His remark, I, I think it was as a listener, I hope people coming out of two going into three would see it as, I don't want to say more than a tool because in some degree these are all tools, yeah. but I, I, I'd hope the listener's experience would be a little bit more informed going into that episode totally. so that they would appreciate like what wasn't said in that. Um, but I'm glad that that, I'm glad it caught your attention and I'm, and you know, ruffled you just a little bit. Like yeah. that feels appropriate. Of for course. It. And it should, I mean, that's what, <laughs> this is, you know, and I, I work with plenty of people that are very dogmatic and are like, this is the only way. And I am not that person. I am a person that knows how to, you know, I'm trained and I know how to help people in a certain way and I know it, it can and is very effective but there are also a lot of other tools out there that are effective for people and i'm as if people get out of pain from my perspective i don't really care <laughs> what happens i mean i do care but i want people to it's like the number one goal is just to get out of pain so i i, I absolutely was glad you included that because i was i thought it was a strong choice for you guys to start off with the work that dr huggins and i do because we uh, i think she and i i don't want to speak for her but we're kind of used to to a certain degree people feeling like we're kind of fringy becoming more and more accepted. So I thought starting off with this was a strong choice. I appreciated it, of course, but I did think it was a, a strong choice. I also, this just came to me, but I also found it really interesting that most of the people that spoke to medical marijuana and think it's mm. a, mm. F- it, almost a fad. I thought that was really right. interesting. Um, uh, yeah, that it's really gonna kind of phase out. I, I, I thought that was interesting. I hadn't heard that before. I totally resonated with that. I'm glad you brought that up, actually. That was something that, and I'm not opposed to medical marijuana at all. Yeah, same. But I was uh, just shocked to hear that. Well, and when we look at like trends in, we've got trends in in diagnoses and trends in medication, uh, what is prescribed for people. And right now, of course, like marijuana is kind of a catch-all. And again, I'm not opposed to it, but it is like, "Eh, you can't sleep. You got pain. You anxious. You're you're not eating enough. Like, here you go. (laughs) Like, just... Have a gummy bear. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> and we can see, like, historically, you could actually see, like, oh, yeah, we, as a as medical professionals, pushed this medication really hard for this five to ten years, and then it kind of faded. And then this thing we pushed for five to ten years. So I I actually really, that really resonated with me, as I thought, I have heard it prescribed for everything right now. So... We'll be right back with more from Christy and Daniel right after I remind you that The Pain Podcast is produced by Bloodstream Media and made possible thanks to our sponsor, Tremo Pharmaceuticals. Tremo was founded with the goal of developing and delivering non-opioid pain therapies for people with rare diseases and other select patient conditions. Tremo is currently investigating two COX-2 selective NSAIDs. NSAID, for those who aren't familiar, stands for non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. 
While neither of these treatments are FDA approved, they are in clinical trials and you can learn more about those trials, Tremo's mission, and the dedicated team leading it by going to tremorx.com. That's T-R-E-M-E-A-U-R-X.com. Tremo, leading the way for those left behind in pain. How has COVID and, and quarantine and, and the last two, three months here of uncertainty and disruption influenced how either of you think about either pain or really healthcare in general? Do you think COVID's made pain worse? Has this time period impacted either of your personal experiences with pain? If, if it has, that would be interesting to me as well. I think uh, I'll speak in general, not to my specific um, experience with pain, but I think it's absolutely impacted healthcare overall and, and specifically pain. People don't they, they don't have access to their physical therapists. And even if they're doing those physical therapy activities, you know, through Zoom or online, it's not the same. Um, I know a lot of, uh, I love the last episode on, on children's pain. And, you know, I have friends that are trying to do uh, OT and, and physical therapy with their kids and how challenging that is doing that at mm-hmm. home. Um, I think, you know, people are starting to, uh, embrace telehealth, but it's been a process to get there. And how do we prepare people um, to be prepared for telehealth appointments? What do they ne- need to know? How do they describe their symptoms? How do they talk to their doctors um, in that way? And then also just to summarize, but it, also just to add a couple more points, you know, there's no acupuncture there's they can't go to the chiropractor um you know all of these things impact people's pain and then on top of it we're stressed we're anxious we're we don't know when things are going to open up again i mean i am in new york so things are but i know california is just as bad but it's you know like there's all these unknowns that just add to that anxiety I, I want to just jump, piggyback on that, that, you know, I talk a lot about anxiety in my work because anxiety and pain are so interconnected. I jokingly, and I don't mean to be glib, but I've jokingly said people have asked me like, oh, how is your practice going? And I was like, well, I'm in the anxiety business and anxiety is booming right now. <laughs> so and I, I'm obviously making a joke here. I don't mean to be glib or like make fun of anything, but it's like people are nervous right now. That's like where we're at. People are anxious. They're scared and it's understandable. Um, and so to directly answer your question, Patrick, I have... Uh, a lot of people that I'm working with right now are experiencing both a lot more anxiety and a lot more pain um, uh, for myself. Do you but, find yourself doing anything? And sorry, just to stay on that for a second, as a provider, do you find yourself doing anything differently as a result of that? Um, that is a great question. I think that for, for me, I think one of my strengths as a provider is that I can bring a fair amount of like authenticity. I'm pretty much myself when I'm in session, when I'm out of session, like I'm just, I am who I am. And I think that can be freeing for people just to be as authentic as possible. And so with, to answer your question, I guess with a lot of my clients right now, I'm telling them like, I don't have the answers right now. You know, we, none of us do right now. We're all kind of walking around in the dark here. And, and while that is scary, but knowing we're all in this together, trying to figure, trying to figure this out, that can be somewhat soothing and, and um, anxiety reducing. So I guess my, my, my goal would be to just normalize that it's okay to be a certain degree amount of, of, of to be afraid to a certain degree right now. Um, the other thing I'm doing and just mm-hmm. pr- more practical is just encouraging people to keep to a more strict regimen of like their anxiety tools and techniques to manage them, to manage that. Just because if you're sitting home alone, reading the news all day, of course, your anxiety is just going to climb and climb and climb and you're going to feel yeah. worse and worse and worse and worse. So. Yes. You, were you starting to mention something as well about your personal experience during this time? Yeah, well, I, was just, I haven't personally. I haven't experienced uh, like an increase in pain, but I I know with my own anxiety, like it's affecting my sleep. So I'm not sleeping as well as I, you know, not every single night, but in general, my sleep is worse than it was, say, pre-COVID. I'm noticing that, and mm-hmm. a few other like I'm just obviously my job is to be attuned to anxiety, so I'm hyper attuned to it in myself, and I'm noticing just little things here and there that I'm like, oh, this is not the way I normally behave or feel. This is this mm. is different than normal. So I can see in myself that this is. I mean, it's even in my day to day life, it may not actually be affecting me that much because I do a lot of work online anyway. It's still getting to me, not being able to be around right. people and not being able to go to the grocery store without thinking three times about everything I'm doing there. You know, it's it's exhausting. 
and anxiety producing. So it's interesting because as you mentioned, not being able to be around people and and there is certainly isolation, literally the the word is used in part of the recommended practices <laughs> at times, but I haven't, to the point you made about we're all in this, I haven't experienced loneliness in this because every call, I feel like every call I'm on with my right. mom, with a client here, my wife, anybody, some part of the conversation involves just like, oh, how you doing? Like all things yeah. considered, what's going on? We're all in this boat. So I have found that comforting as opposed to experiences of either heightened anxiety, depression, or pain, severe hemophilia related pain, where like maybe I'm laid up on the couch for four or five days a week or longer, but the world hasn't stopped moving. So there's an right. increased sense of loneliness because my experience is is not a shared experience in, in that moment. And that's why community is so important because within that community, there is shared experience. Now community is the planet because we're all in this one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We're all in this together, hopefully. <laughs> To, the, to, to that point, actually, early when this first started and everyone who was going into isolation, so many clients were like, this is awesome. I feel no pressure to go out and do anything. There's like no FOMO whatsoever. There's no, uh, I can just like stay at home and watch TV and feel totally okay with that. That said, mm -hmm. now that we're over two months into this, it's, that is, uh, that's what we're, I'm, in the past few weeks, I'm seeing people be like, okay, I'm over that. I'm, I'm, I'm done with this. But yes, early on, I was hearing so much of that of like, I don't feel lonely at all. This is wonderful. Like it's why I can actually relax at a deeper <laughs> level, which I totally get. So yeah, I, and I also say that as someone with with a wife and with a dog. So my my home yeah. life is is really grounded and and fulfilling. But I'm I'm very conscious of those who are on their own right now. And I'm I'm yes. certain if I was on my own right now, my experience would be so much different. So just knowing who I am, it would be so much different. So I'm, I, I remind myself of that when I find, I, my, when my head gets too spinny, I do pull back to remind myself, you know, your conditions could be way different and your experience would be far less totally. uh, satisfying if that were the case. It's tough for people living alone right now. I will yeah. say my clients, my clients that are living alone right now, they're having a harder time. It just is. We we're we're social beings by nature. It's hard not to be around people. Yeah, Christy, who do you think stands to benefit from the Pain Podcast and from and from listening to this blend of firsthand stories, uh, provider points of view, public health expert points of view? Who best stands to benefit from this? Uh, I loved this question. I I think. I would love it if more providers would listen to, <laughs> to this. Amen. I mean, they're the first that come to mind. I think providers overall need to hear more personal stories. They need to understand pain. Um, and that it, you, this was already mentioned earlier, but that it's individualized that, you know, I would love it if more providers listen to this. I think it would also, anybody who works with people who live with pain, you know, physical therapists, chiropractors, anyone. And then of course, um, patients as well. But uh, I think, you know, you wouldn't necessarily think to promote this to physicians, but I think they could seriously benefit from, from this podcast. Daniel, you seem to agree with that. Uh, yeah, I 100% agree with that. Providers would be, would be huge, but also you know, the, the stat that we quote a lot, which actually is changing because I think it's increased, but we say one in four people deal with chronic pain in this country. And that means everybody, if you know, you know, three other people or four, <laughs> then you know somebody in chronic pain. Uh, so I kind of believe that this is useful for everybody. Of course, I'm biased because this is my world. But I do think that if the, we all learn a little bit more about our own psychology, there's no harm in that. And finally, as we're starting to wrap up, and we did talk about this a little bit already, but uh, we're hopeful to do a season two and to keep the pod pain podcast growing. Where should it go next? Where else could we spend a bit more time? Uh, we spoke a bit earlier uh, about women and pain specifically and hearing more from women in pain. There were not many patient female patient voices. I don't know if there were any patient female voices this season, actually, who weren't also providers in some way. Um, so that's a great point. And then, uh, Daniel, you brought up more of the science and data to support some of the claims and, and that, that could also be a great focus or maybe a specific science heavy episode or two might, might be a neat way to think about a season two. Are there other can topics that some, you would like to? Yeah. Can I add something to that before Please. we leave the research on um, piece of it? I think, you know, that's a really great 
point that there is a lot of research out there, but there's not a lot of pain research specific to women or people of color. And there's, we also know that, you know, conditions such as endometriosis, migraines, it's, they're underfunded. So, you know, it's, there is research out there, but I think it's also, you know, would be a really great piece to focus in on the lack of research, the lack of funding on certain um, conditions that are very central to women's health and women's pain. That's an excellent point. I I think, um, yeah, I think an episode or more devoted to research and speaking to people who are in positions to make decisions about what gets researched and what does not and how those decisions get made, that would be very interesting to hear about and to ask some questions of. Uh, so I think that's a great suggestion. Is there anything else like that? Oh, sorry, Christy, to your, to your point you made in the, in the episode that, you know, I work on a team, we've done various, we've done a fair amount of research. And unfortunately it's uh, mostly white dudes doing a lot of this. And we do have women, yes. but they're mostly white women. So it's not a lot of people of color that are uh, doing the research right now. There are people out there in the pain world, but there's not a lot of people of color in the pain world, but there's not a lot. So that would be something also that I think is really important to discuss and to do what we can to better that. Yeah. And I I did talk to that in the episode too. There's a reason that, you know, people of color don't want to be involved in clinical trials. So yeah, it's absolutely of concern. And just uh, these conditions are underfunded overall, you know, and I, I think I spoke to it, but I don't think it was mentioned during the episode, but the, you know, just the lack of representation at the highest levels of research, the INH only has one third of women at the top levels of, you know, and doing these clinical trials and research that, you know, we fund what impacts us. So that's representation in, you know, women and people of color and black people, we need more representation, period. Another thing that comes to mind, and I may get even in trouble for saying this, but years ago, there was a handful of us from the clinic where I used to work. We were asked to work with what's called the Laser Spine Institute. I don't know if either of you have ever heard of it. It's one of the largest uh, for-profit providers of back surgeries in the country. Um, and they asked us to consult with them because at that point they were considering, and I don't, to be honest, I still don't even fully understand what they were considering, but they wanted to talk to us. And they uh, were kind of gathering information about the work we do versus the surgeries that they do. And they are a factory of surgeries. We went to the Laser Spine Institute, the headquarters, which was in Tampa. Um, and I walked away from that absolutely horrified because mm-hmm. 90% of the back surgeries they are doing are completely unnecessary. They were just for people that are in chronic pain, but these surgeries are, they've been proven to not be useful at all. And it blew my mind. I was like, this is like the terrible side of the for-profit healthcare system that is just destroying people. And surgery from my perspective, this should be the absolute last resort. So uh, that might be something that I think would be really beneficial to talk about is like, look at places like Laser Spine Institute, which I think is a nightmare factory. <laughs> not trying to be too hyperbolic, but the idea of all these people getting unnecessary surgeries feels absolutely insane to me. So that would be something that, okay, people are in so much pain that they're so desperate that they're willing to, people fly from all over the world to go to these, the laser spine institute, this one in Chicago or Illinois somewhere, and then one in Florida and Texas and a few other places, um, just to do get these surgeries that ultimately uh, have not been proven to be successful. Great suggestions. Um, Well, again, thank you both for your contributions to this season and for coming on to discuss it after the fact here in this roundtable. I really appreciate the insights that you have provided, and um, I am hopeful that we'll have reasons to talk again about pain in the not-too-distant future. So, Christy, Daniel, thank you very much. Thank you for having us. Yes, thank you. Patrick, it was great to be on, and Christy, it's great to meet you. Yeah, you too. All right. One last time, thank you to Dr. Daniel Lyman, Christy Van Horn, and all of the guests that we had on season one of The Pain Podcast. Thank you to everyone at Bloodstream Media for making it happen. Thank you to Tremo Pharmaceuticals. Visit TremoRx.com to learn more about their work. And please share The Pain Podcast with friends and family who you think could benefit from the stories. 
information and insights shared throughout season one. And it's our hope that we'll be coming back with a season two before long. Until then, please check out bloodstreammedia.com to listen to the Bloodstream podcast hosted by my wife, Natalie, and I. Ask the Expert podcast hosted by Amy Board, speaking to clinical experts throughout hematology and many other podcasts for your auditory enjoyment bloodstreammedia.com. Thanks so much for listening. My name is Patrick James Lynch, and I hope you enjoyed season one of The Pain Podcast.